Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we're here for another poetry discussion. Why? Because it's Monday, and by God, we have poetry on Mondays. That's what we do here on Strip Coverlet. There's poetry on Mondays, and on Mondays, there is poetry. We are here with Waiting for the Barbarians by C.P. Kafafi. Um, I am not my... Thick Midwestern tongue is not allowing me to say that Kavafi correctly, so I apologize to uh, anyone who is offended by my pronunciation of that name. Look, on Mondays we have poetry here, and I've got a lot of poetry slots open, so if you have a poem you want me to talk about, be sure to mention it in the comment section below. This poem is by, um, wow. I don't know sure what's going on outside. This is by request. So I am also going to be doing a poetry discussion every day for National Poetry Month. Uh, so be sure to leave comments and suggestions below. Also, there is a link to my personal channel to be found in the description below. Over on my personal channel, I talk about philosophy. We're going to get a little into philosophy today at the end of this poetry reading because there are some things going on there. But... Um, let's get into it because I think we just need to go ahead and start. This is still difficult for me. I am a Luddite, so let me get to the right thing here. Waiting for the barbarians. What are we waiting for assembled in the forum? The barbarians are due here today. Why isn't anything going on in the Senate? Why are the senators sitting there without legislating? Because the barbarians are coming today. What's the point of senators making laws now? Once the barbarians are here, they'll do the legislating. Why did our emperor get up so early? And why is he sitting enthroned at the city's main gate, in state, wearing the crown? Because the barbarians are coming today, and the emperor's waiting to receive their leader. He's even got a scroll to give him, loaded with titles with imposing names. Why have our two consuls and praetors come out today wearing their embroidered, their scarlet togas? Why have they put on bracelets with so many amethysts, rings sparkling with magnificent emeralds? Why are they carrying elegant canes, beautifully worked in silver gold? Because the barbarians are coming today, and things like that dazzle the barbarians. Why don't our distinguished, our distinguished orators turn up as usual to make their speeches, say what they have to say? Because the barbarians are coming today, and they're bored by rhetoric and public speaking. Why this sudden bewilderment, this confusion, how serious people's faces have become? Why are the streets and squares emptying so rapidly? Everyone is going home lost in thought. Because night has fallen and the barbarians haven't come. And some of our men just in front of the border say there are no barbarians any longer. Now what's going to happen to us without barbarians? Those people were a kind of solution. This poem feels... Um, has the tone, perhaps, of a George Saunders short story. Now, all of the literature besides the philosophy that I'm going to mention today is from after this poem. This poem was written in 1898, published in 1904, um, but it reminds me both of George Saunders in tone and perhaps sort of... Um, dereliction of duty, and it reminds me of another poem from a good Missouri boy, by the way, though he would not have claimed it, T.S. Eliot, The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot, and I'm only going to read the final stanza, or the final section, because it's, um, I think that it's I think that the tone at the end is very similar to what we're getting here. It goes, 
Here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is life, is, for thine is thee. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. <clears throat> not with a bang, but a whimper. This is the way the world ends. If you look this poem up, if you go into some of the literature about it, most of what you're going to see is how everyone says that this poem is about, uh, not T.S. Eliot's, everyone says that the Kavafi poem is about civilization in decline. And hey, fair enough, that seems to be a general direction that this poem is going. We have all of these wares, we have all of this fancy stuff, and it goes for naught, despite the fact that these people are waiting on the barbarians to come, the barbarians to end them, and it never happens, not with a bang, but a whimper. Still, we are left to believe that these people are in decline, that this situation is for naught, that this civilization is ending. But something else that's going on here is how seriously we take ourselves. Now... Ironically, one of the things that humor is used to do is exploit the seriousness with which something is portrayed. Exploit the seriousness with which we normally deal with things. If you, if you crack a joke in a serious situation, it takes the edge off because what we're doing is undercutting the tension. What we're doing here is presenting, perhaps, a civilization in decline, and it's all a big joke. But how often do we take ourselves seriously? How often do we take our own plight seriously? And do we take it too seriously? Are we waiting on our own barbarians? Are we creating our own barbarians? Are we forcing our own downfall? This is something I think is very interesting to think about. How often do we ready ourselves for trauma? How often do we ready ourselves for trauma that does not come? Trauma that does not happen. Simple things on a daily basis. I don't want to go to work today because my coworker is such a jerk. I don't want to go to work today because there's always that lady who expects a refund but doesn't have a receipt, and I'm put in a terrible position. She always comes in on Tuesdays, and that is a very trying time for me at work. Now... During the time where we are making these statements, not wanting to go to work because of our jerk coworker or that customer who comes in and demands a refund, we are putting stressors on ourselves. We are readying ourselves for trauma, which puts us in the trauma response, despite the fact the trauma is not there. Maybe your jerk coworker calls in. You don't even have to see him that night, but you are still suffering for it. Maybe that lady decided to kick off and go to another store. But still, you're suffering in absentia. We put ourselves in the state of mind 
of suffering, and so we suffer. This poem is maybe not about that. This poem maybe is about the societal level suffering, the sort of hauntological um, abstraction that the future is canceled. Maybe. Perhaps. But ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, does it not? Can I slip that in there and get away with it? Look, anything that suffers on a big level is representative of suffering on a little level. And what's suffering on a little level is representative of what suffers on a big level. You take very poor control of your own household, the country suffers. The next generation will suffer. You run your household too strict, the country suffers. The country is run too strict, your household suffers. The country is run with loose purse strings, your household suffers. So the big and the little are always related, and in fact, sometimes the best way to express one is through the other. If I want to tell a story about communist Russia and how strict it is, it helps to zoom in on the family. But if I'm trying to tell a story about a family out of control, mightn't it sort of do well to tell a story about the American government, right? By, you, you were able to, so you've got a, in a telescope, you've got the little lens and the big lens, right? They're the same telescope. That's how literature works as well. But I want to get back to that idea about being in the state of already suffering. For that, we're going to go to the Stoics. I may or may not have allegedly copied and pasted these very quotes off the internet. Don't tell on me. From the Stoics, from Epictetus, we get what oppresses and scares us. It is our own thoughts, obviously. Epictetus Discourses, Book 2, 16. Also from Epictetus, it is not events that disturb people. It is their judgments concerning them. Epictetus, in Chiridion, Chapter 5. And from Marcus Aurelius, things have no hold on the soul. They stand there unmoving outside it. Disturbance comes only from within, from our own perceptions. Marcus Aurelius Meditations, Book 4.3. Now, think of something that has happened negatively in your life. Certainly, there were physical manifestations of it. You went through a nasty breakup and you couldn't eat for days. Obviously you could. You could have decided that you were no longer bothered that Becky broke up with you or that Chad was such a jerk. You could have just decided it didn't matter to you. It feels in the moment like we can't do that, but indeed we can. We have to be able to do that. But we suffer up here because we anticipate these things. We take pain from the past and from the future, and we just filter it. We filter it through this body we've got. This poem is about filtering that pain of the future that future being canceled, taking that pain from the future and living in it despite the fact that it has not happened. But we also do the opposite. We take pain from the past, and we want to waller around in it like it's happening now. Strangely, it doesn't usually work with real pain. I broke my ankle my junior year in high school. If I think about that event... I can't really conjure the pain in my ankle. I went through a nasty breakup my senior year in high school. If I think about that, I can conjure that pain. And why is that? 
why is it that the barbarians from the past, the barbarians from the future, we can do battle with them when they are not here, when they are not present. We can do battle with them when there is no battle to be had. But all of those battles... In not with a bang, but a whimper. All of those battles, all of that pain, was kind of a solution for us, wasn't it? All of that pain was sort of a solution. Instead of holding ourselves accountable for the here and the now, for what was at stake in the moment, we just sort of waller around in that pain that is no more or is not to be. That is the genius of this poem, that it is about that manifestation of something that is not. And we pick a very nasty incarnation for it, the barbarians. This is a really brilliant poem. But I think that is all I have to say about this one. If you like this sort of thing, it really does me a lot of help if you decide to hit that like button. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. So consider hitting that subscribe button to stick around for more. If you hit the bell uh, icon, what it does is YouTube will tell you when I have posted a video. And hey, I've got poetry on Mondays. Currently on Thursdays, we're going through Fairy Tale by Stephen King. This week will be chapter 27. Don't miss it. National Poetry Month, where we will have a poetry discussion every day. And I hope to have you back for the next video. Now I'm going to have to click around and figure out how to stop this thing.